the word soul used as a synonym for heart. Finally, it is necessary to point out that there are times when instead of heart, the centre of the living being we now are, thanks to the union of our spirit and our body, writers of scripture employ soul as a synonymous term. This development is common enough in literature. The specific literary figure involved is called synecdoche, the whole being substituted for the part. In the case of the use of soul for heart, the whole of our living person is substituted for the nucleus of that person, where all thoughts, emotions, decisions and pangs of conscience occur. This substitution has parallels in English. My very being longs for thee. Problems of interpretation only arise if one mistakenly takes this common literary use to mean that somehow the soul is a separate entity of our makeup, rather than the entire being we have seen it to be, encompassing our body and spirit in a living union. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that is, your whole person, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 5 as a man thinks in his soul, that is his heart, so he is. Proverbs 23, 7 The creation of Eve, Genesis 2, 18 through 24 Up until now we have been speaking of mankind in the generic sense, man with a capital M, comprising both genders of our species. Before we move on to the original status of our first parents in the Garden of Eden, along with their temptation, fall and judgment, we must first consider what the Bible has to say about the creation of Eve and its implications. To appreciate the nature of Satan's attack on Adam and Eve and the consequences of their sin to all subsequent relations between men and women, it is first necessary to understand, by way of preface, that the status of the relationship between the first man and the first woman in paradise before the fall was very different from what would obtain when they had been expelled from the Garden of Eden after the fall. Then the Lord God said immediately after giving Adam instructions not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in verse 17, It is not a good thing for the man to be alone. I will make for him a helper compatible with him. Now the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky from the dust of the ground and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever he called any living thing, that became its name. So Adam gave names to every beast and to all the birds of the sky and to every wild creature, but he did not find one that could be a helper compatible with him. Then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and when he was asleep, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh behind it. And the Lord God sculpted the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman. Then he brought her to Adam. And Adam said, This now is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman, because from man she was taken. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, for the two will become a single body. Genesis 2, 18 through 24 as it was with Adam, so the creation of Eve's body is unique. Neither of our first parents were born, Adam's body being formed from the dust of the ground and Eve's constructed from part of Adam's. In terms of her inner essence, however, that is to say her human spirit, we have no additional information given in the passage quoted. What we do have, however, is the statement in Genesis 1.27 that delineates the creation of the spiritual essence of both Adam and Eve. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, so that he may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, and over the beasts, and over the whole earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created the man, that is, Adam, in his image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 the shift from man, no definite article in the Hebrew, to the man, with the definite article in the Hebrew, is highly significant. On a collective basis, verse 26 applies to all human beings, that is, man, so that we may say that all mankind in a corporate sense must possess the image and likeness of God, and consequently the mandate to respond to God's authority.
In verse 27, however, the switch to the singular means that the focus has shifted from the general, all human beings, to the specific, Adam in particular. And here the scripture is careful to attribute the image of God to Adam, but not to repeat this attribution when male and female come into view at the end of the verse. This apparent, but only apparent, contradiction is repeated in the New Testament where Paul can write in 1 Corinthians 11. 7. That a man is the image and glory of God, but that on the other hand a woman is the glory of her husband, and yet say in a second epistle to that same church, 2 Corinthians 3.18, that all of us, clearly men and women alike, are being transformed into the same image, that is, becoming more Christ-like. What are we to say then? Do women share in the image of God or not? Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is the beginning of the answer to this question, for in spite of carefully avoiding a positive answer, neither is a negative reply forthcoming in that passage. In fact, these two verses supply no basis for finding any spiritual differences between men and women. The only distinctions to be found are the two already mentioned. 1. Male and female are separate categories. However, from the collective statement of verse 26, the conclusion seems unavoidable that the basis for this distinction is not spiritual, since no spiritual distinction is mentioned in this statement of the corporate creation of mankind, and we should expect something here if indeed men and women were to be distinguished spiritually. It must be assumed, therefore, that the human spirits of men and women are essentially the same and that the mention of male and female categories in the following verse is a reference to our respective bodies. 2. Verse 27 makes no specific positive attribution of the image of God to Eve, but this is a far different matter from denying the image altogether. The first point given is easily buttressed by Scripture. In Christ, a spiritual relationship, there is no male or female. Galatians 3.28 Men and women are equally fellow heirs of the gift of eternal life, 1 Peter 3, 7, and, in eternity, both are relieved of the institution of marriage with its respective biblical roles, which is at the root of the apparent dilemma with which we are now dealing, Matthew 22, 30. We may also make a persuasive argument from silence and add that in all the passages of the Bible that speak of our hope, our resurrection and reward, one searches in vain for any evidence of significant distinction between men and women in eternity based on gender. The second point given is also conditioned by our current earthly circumstance. Less so in the Garden of Eden, but much more so after the fall, the relationship between husband and wife turns on the issue of authority. As co-heirs in Christ, women clearly must share in the image and likeness of God, partaking of the exact same spiritual essence men enjoy. But just as the male role was altered by the fall, Satan's usurpation of man's rulership over the earth and the replacement of perfection with toil and hardship, the female role was also changed dramatically in respect to authority relationships. As a result, Scripture is careful neither to deny woman's spiritual equality nor to minimize the authority of the husband by stressing that equality. For before God we are all equal, but in this present corrupt body we are all under various forms of authority, all ultimately delegated by God, and our proper response to that authority is intimately connected to the spiritual conflict that now rages unseen all around us. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. In Eden, just as the bodies of Adam and Eve were distinct from one another, so were their roles. However, in the perfection of paradise, this distinction did not have the authority implications that would later obtain after the introduction of sin, which makes the exercise of authority in human relationships at all levels absolutely essential. 